So far in our study of trigonometry, we've learned that there are six different things we can do to an angle. We can take its sine, its cosine, its tangent, its cotangent, its secant, or its cosecant. And we've talked about, for example, how to take the sine of 30 degrees or pi over 6, 45 degrees or pi over 4, or 60 degrees or pi over 3. And we can do the same thing with the cosine, pi over 6, pi over 4, or pi over 3. In fact, we can do that with any of these. With our video on applications, we also learned that we can take the, the sine or the secant or the tangent of an angle that's not one of those nice angles. It's not 30, 45, or 60 degrees, but like 3 degrees or 4.7 degrees. Of course, we need a calculator to do that, but we can do it. The point I'm trying to make is that these are the only six trig functions, but the thing that we plug into each of these functions is an angle, and that angle can be any real number. In the case of degrees, it's usually somewhere between 0 and 360, but it could be 572 or it could be 7,963. It can also be a negative number, like negative 30 degrees. At any rate, it's a real number, and when we're in radians, that real number has a different feel to it, but it's still a real number. For example, we can plug pi over 6 into cosine, or pi over th 3 into cosecant. When we do that, we get a, a number out. The point that I want to make here is that by plugging something in, doing the sine to it, or taking the sine of that angle, and expecting a result, we're actually using a function. I can write my function this way, or I can write it in the terminology that I'm, I'm used to, function notation. But what's changing here, what varies, what my input is, is theta. For any of these trigonometric ratios, I've just picked one here for to use as an example, I can plug any number I want into here. I can plug in 30, 45, or 60, pi over 6, pi over 4, or pi over 3, or I can plug in 3 degrees, or 12 pi over 17. When I do, I take the sine of that angle, and it produces another number. It's kind of hard to demonstrate right now, because it'll be easier once we know how to graph the sine of theta. But it, it turns out that the sine of theta is a function. And what that means, remember, is that every time I plug a number in here, I get an output, and it's unique for that input. In other words, if I plug pi over 3 in here, the sine of pi over 3 is the square root of 3 over 2, and it's only the square root of 3 over 2. Why can't be anything else? That's what makes this a function. It'll be easier to demonstrate that when we know how to graph these, but that's a little ways off yet. So all of these are functions. I can write y equals the tangent of theta. I can choose various values for theta, take their tangents, and each one will produce a y value. Now, that's all I want to say about functions, so I'm going to go ahead and erase the screen. I want to take a look at something we already know, but from a different perspective. Here's a right triangle. I've labeled it with its right angle, and with its angle theta highlighted. There's another non-right angle right here, but I'm interested in this one right now. If I label its sides, opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse, as those pertain to theta, in other words, this is the one opposite for theta. If I was interested in this angle here, I'd be talking about this as the opposite, but I'm interested in this angle, theta. I'm going to label these angles opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse, and then I'm going to relabel them. Remember how we changed those, those letters from O, A, and H to A, B, and R? Well, I'm going to do something similar but slightly different here as well. Before I do, though, let me sort of um, motivate why I would want to do that. Right now, my triangle looks like it's floating in space. But what happens if I introduce a set of coordinates? In other words, an X and Y axis. Kind of going to do this a little bit backwards here because I have a hard time drawing that. If this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis, I have that same triangle, but now instead of floating in space, it's kind of anchored. It's sort of tethered to the coordinate plane. 
Now, if I imagine that this is a point, well, it is a point, it's the point where this line segment, which happens to be the hypotenuse of a right triangle, and this line segment, which happens to be a vertical side of a right triangle, it's the point where they meet. If I imagine that that is a point on a circle, which will come to this, but that's going to be the unit circle. If I imagine that that's the point on a circle, then I can think of this not necessarily just as the hypotenuse, but as the radius of the circle. Also, I can take this point and make the claim that it is x units away from the origin, which is right here. I can also make the claim that this point up here is y units away from the x-axis. And I can also label the side y. It's y units long. Now, with that information, I can say that the sine of theta, it's opposite over hypotenuse, but now that's y over r. And the cosine of theta is adjacent which is x over r. If I multiply, by, multiply both sides by r, I get r sine of theta equals y, and r cosine of theta equals x. Now, right now, they feel backwards to me because I've been doing this for so long. We tend to think of sine is coming first and cosine is coming second, but I also tend to think of x is coming first and y is coming second. Algebraically speaking, if we want the coordinates of a point, we put them in this order. But according to this, that means I can write the coordinates of a point as r cosine theta comma r sine theta. We can also, from this diagram, say that the tangent of theta, remember that tangent is opposite over adjacent, it's going to be y over x. Now y, we've said, is r sine theta, and x is r cosine of theta. If I cancel the r's, I get sine of theta over cosine of theta. So that's a way of verifying that we have the identity that we talked about earlier, which is that the tangent of theta is always the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta for any angle. Well, this is almost a side note here, but I, I do want to uh, do a little summarizing here. We now have uh, the sine of theta, which is equal to y over r. The cosine of theta, which is equal to x over r. And the tangent of theta, which is equal to y over x. From that, we can also find the cotangent of theta, because it's just the reciprocal of the tangent, the secant of theta, because it's just the reciprocal of cosine, and the cosecant of theta, because it's just the reciprocal of the sine. So now we have all six of our trigonometric identities in a completely different form. They mean exactly the same thing, but now I have this angle let me highlight it for you. This angle here, I've placed it in, in, it in standard position by putting its initial side on the positive x-axis and its terminal side up away counterclockwise from its initial side. Its sine is still opposite of hypotenuse. Its secant is still hypotenuse over adjacent. But because I've relabeled the sides and I've, I've labeled this one as though it's the radius of a circle, We've got a different way of thinking about those trigonometric functions. It's important to note, and we'll do the first one by definition, that this, because it's the radius of a circle, it can't be negative. Okay, It's going to turn out much later in the quarter that there is a particular, what's the word I want, a particular scenario, I guess, in which you can think of the radius as being negative, but for now, we just want to think of it as a distance or a length, and therefore it can't be negative. So r has to be greater than or equal to zero. But we also need to make the observation that x could theoretically be zero, and y could theoretically be zero, and that would cause problems here, 
and here, as well as here and here. So we're also going to say that x cannot be 0 and y cannot be 0. Now that's really just for this notation here. Let's take a second and talk about what happens if x is 0, for example. If x is 0, this function here is undefined. Tangent of theta is y over x. x can't be 0 because there's a, a that would put 0 in the denominator. Secant also would be undefined. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, that x can't be 0. Here's a set of axes, and here's a radius. Here's a y value, and so here's our y. And if I move this so that the, uh, the, the, the point, the end of the radius, the line segment that is the radius, gets closer and closer and closer to the y-axis, then I eventually would end up with something that looks like this. And if I moved it just a tiny little bit more, just one more tick over here, then it would be on the y-axis. And at that point, the radius would still be whatever the radius was. And y would be equal to the radius, but x would be equal to 0. When x is equal to 0, we have an angle whose initial side is a length of 0. Right? There's no, there's no x value at all. The x value is 0. And the terminal side is up here somewhere. So x is equal to 0 and y is equal to whatever r is. x and r are equal. And we call that a quadrantal angle. It's an angle who, that's coterminal with the y-axis. If y is equal to 0, then we end up with an angle that looks like that. There is no y, there's no, no vertical distance here at all, right? And x and r then are the same but y is 0. So when x is 0 and y is 0, we have quadrantal angles. It's also important to point out, and I'll use this diagram to do it, that it doesn't matter what my radius is. I'm going to use a thicker pen. I'll highlight the, the radius that I have from my first example, but then I'll extend it. Here's a second point. We've actually talked about this before, but we're talking about it again. Uh, now I have a new, I lost my pen there. I have a new length for x, and I have a new length for y. But the ratio of x to y, or x to r, or y to r, are the same in this big triangle, and in this smaller triangle. So it doesn't matter which of the points along this line we choose, the sine of this angle will always be the same. The tangent of this angle, the cosecant of this angle, will always be the same no matter where along this line we choose our terminal point. Okay, this summary down here incorporates this definition of sine, this definition of cosine, and this definition of tangent. So I'm going to erase those, and in fact I'm going to erase this one as well. I want to keep this information and this information handy, but I'll write it in a different place. y equals r sine theta is down here, x equals r cosine theta is here, and the fact that I can write x comma y, a point on the plane, as r cosine th theta comma r sine theta, that's down here as well. So now I can erase this part. I want to do that because I want more room on the screen to talk about one of the ways in which we can use this sort of new way of looking at sine and cosine. The main thing I want to point out is, notice in this diagram here, I've got all of the x and y axes here, but I've only used the first quadrant. Right? Both my x and my y values are positive, and the angle is present only in the first quadrant, which kind of begs the question, why bother to write the whole set of axes? Well, the whole set of axes is handy if your angle is bigger than 90 degrees. For example, if I have an angle 
that goes from here out to there, something that looks kind of like that, then my angle is all of this. Let me get my highlighter. It's all of this. This is the angle I'm looking at here. And that's bigger than 90 degrees. I can't deal with that in just a right triangle. I can still use right triangle trigonometry to figure out all of its sines and cosines and whatnot. We'll come to that in just a minute. But the, the angle itself is bigger than 90 degrees. And so if I'm restricted to only dealing with triangles with a right angle in them, then I can't represent this angle here in that way. So the reason for setting things up this way is that it then opens up the possibility that my angle can actually be anything between 0 and 2 pi or 360 degrees. That last one, by the way, is this angle here. It's a very large angle. In fact, the angle could be more than 360 degrees. But the point I want to make just now is that it can be more than 90, and for the moment we'll stick to angles that are up to 90 degrees and more than 90 degrees but less than 360 degrees.